Hey everybody, welcome to Daring Live. I'm glad you could be here. Um, let's see, my partner in crime, Jamie Laddie, uh, is, is is not here today, so it's just me. He's he's on a holiday in, in the UK visiting family. And um, so, it's, so it's great to have you here. And today we're gonna have a good show. We have Ma Max Wareham here. Uh, and he's gonna, he's gonna be talking about um, Rudy Lyle. He wrote a book about Rudy Lyle, the unsung hero of the five string banjo. And we're going to go over his playing styles and uh, and demonstrate, you know, demonstrate uh, some of his, some of his his licks and some of his breaks. So let's bring in Max now. Hey, Max. Hey, Dave. How's it going? All right. Um, thanks for coming here. I'm glad you could make it. Um, um, would you like to kick us off with a tune? Sure, I would love to, and thanks for having me. Um, I'll play a tune called the Shenandoah Valley Breakdown. And uh, before I play it, just a quick note on it. Um, it's often attributed to Bill Monroe, uh, but actually it's a tune that Rudy Lyle wrote back in the late 40s, uh, which is one of the things I uncovered working on the book. Anyway, here it is, Shenandoah Valley Breakdown. Fantastic, fantastic playing. Thank you. So tell me, tell, tell us a, a little about yourself, how you got into playing the banjo before we you know, dive into everything about Rudy. Yeah, sure. So I live in Boston um, and I grew up in Connecticut. I have a lot of roots in the Northeast. And um, I came to bluegrass music kind of late. Um, I was in New York studying jazz guitar when I was 18. And uh, I hadn't really been exposed to very much bluegrass music. And I was walking through um, Union Square Park one day, and I heard some, some busking street musicians from North Carolina. And one of them had a banjo. Um, and when I heard that sound, it just like struck like lightning. And I, uh, you know, I, I just had to, to follow that sound. <laughs> and I haven't looked back. <laughs> Awesome. So yeah, yeah. And how'd so, you how'd you learn? Um, 
So I, I left the city and I started uh, tracking down some of the older musicians that that uh, you know have spent their lives playing banjo. Uh, so I my first teacher was Bill Keith, uh, who was living in Woodstock, New York. Yeah. And um, I studied a lot with Tony Trishka as well. So these were two really great mentors to me. Um, and yeah, you know, it was interesting with Bill Keith because he had such a, um, he was such a brilliant mind and he knew so much about jazz. That was sort of a doorway into the banjo for me because I was coming from jazz. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started hanging out with Tony Trishka and taking lessons from him, he really showed me how to play bluegrass banjo, among other things. Um, and I've learned a lot also, I'm very fortunate to have learned a lot from Peter Rowan, who's my father's cousin. Wow, wow. So there's a family connection there. I didn't know him growing up. And as I was getting into the banjo, my mom said, well, you know, dad's cousin is a bluegrass musician. And I had never <laughs> heard of him. <laughs> He's this little bluegrass musician. He likes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, I got in touch with him. Uh, my uncle Bob put us in touch. And um, I've learned a lot from Peter over the years. And uh, I'm currently a part of his bluegrass band as of uh, last year. So, yeah, learned a lot from him, too. Well, I used to. I lived in Woodstock uh, for about six months after hurricane katrina and i used to take lessons with with bill keith too oh cool you go to his house and yeah yeah you know is, they're great I, um you know dive really deep into the circle of fifths probably oh yeah well you remember his clocks all, yeah all that's, of the, that's, clocks, that's, in his all the house. clocks are circle of fifths right i loved it it was great <laughs> They were, it was it's always great. fun just to hang and, and just really dive in. Cause I'm, I come from the jazz world too. I went, I studied jazz guitar. So I was coming from that same world. world ah. So we kind of have a um, connected just as you did, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're kindred then. Yeah. So when you, when you first uh, met Peter, like how, how, how long had you been playing and, and like, you know, how experienced of a banjo player were you at that time? I had a lot of licks, but I, I don't think I had a whole lot of experience traveling around, being on stage and doing it. This was uh, 12, 13 years ago. Uh -huh. um, I actually, uh, I, I went out to the West Coast to um, sort of a, a banjo pilgrimage. I went out to visit Peter to learn from him, and I, I did lessons with a lot of the, the guys out there on the West Coast. Keith Little and Bill Evans and Abram Siegel. Um, okay. But really, I went out to, to hang with Peter for an extended period of time. And he, he kind of got me started on it all. He said, no, I showed up there with a whole list of questions that I had for him. Like I'm written out? From, <laughs> written out. I mean, I, yeah, I was coming from a more academic place, you yeah. know, because I'd been to music school. So I was yeah, thinking yeah. about things in these terms. Yeah. And I went out to his place, and uh, he was very generous and very patient with all of the questions. I mean, he, he answered them the best that he could. Sure. But at a certain point, he said, if you really want to learn the music, um, you, you learn on the bandstand. Um, it's not and really a... Were you playing in a band, in a bluegrass band at that time? I wasn't. All right. I wasn't. I would pick with friends. Yeah, know? yeah. But he said, you really learn it by doing it. And um, he said, you just have to start sitting in with people. You know, just, right. What do you have to lose? And so I did. I started going to, I mean, I was already going to as many bluegrass performances as I could. But you know, I started sitting in more, and sitting in with Peter. I learned a lot, a lot of uh, what to do and what not to do, just sitting mm -hmm. in with Peter. Just, yeah. Uh, and... Um, so yeah, he kind of got me started on that um, sort of experiential learning of the music rather than an intellectual understanding. Right, right. That's a pretty good bluegrass university you went to, though. Yeah, uh, the Peter, <laughs> the Peter Rowan University. Oh yeah, I'm am still in it. Yeah. <laughs> Extend extended degree program. And how long have you been in the band? Tech, you know. Uh, in well, let's band. see. I I've I've sat in with Peter a number of times over the years. Um, sometimes for one song and then gradually I'd stay up on, 
on stage for 15 minutes towards the end of the set. And then I would fill in on gigs. You know, we, we played a handful of festivals before I officially joined the band, which happened last fall when we recorded Calling You From My Mountain. It's the sort of creation of the album in tandem with the, the birth of this uh, new iteration of this bluegrass band. Cool. So a little over a year. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. So, so how did you get so interested in the banjo playing of Rudy Lyle, and you know enough so that that you wanted to write a book about it? Mm. Well, actually, it, it happened while I was on that trip with Peter. Um, I was, had my list of questions, and I I always thought that Peter singing reminded me of Lester Flapp, and I asked Peter about that. I said, "Were you very influenced by Lester as a singer?" And he said, no, not really at all. He said he was more influenced by Jimmy Martin, uh, whose name I had heard, but you know, I wasn't super familiar with his music. Mm -hmm. And so Peter started telling me about this um, high, lonesome sound of the late 40s and early mid 50s of Bill Monroe's band. And of course, Bill Monroe's considered the father of bluegrass music. So... I started digging into that and listening to some of the old recordings. And um, naturally, I was listening for the banjo parts. Um, and the banjo player on almost all of those sessions was Rudy Lyle. Um, so that's how I found out about Rudy. Um, but to tell you the truth about how I started the project, I was playing a festival. I was playing a Bean Blossom Festival in Indiana. It's Bill Monroe's own yeah. festival that he had. Fortunately, it's still going. And I was up there on stage, and I had the strangest feeling. Um, and you have to take this with a big grain of salt. But the feeling that I had as we were on stage performing was that I felt Bill Monroe's presence. And the, the feeling was, look, if you're going to be on my stage playing my music, you need to dig way deeper than you have. Right. <laughs> now, you know, I was probably just imagining that. And that's just, you know, the language that I'm using to understand an emotional experience I had. But um, but anyway, after that show, I thought, I, I do need to go deeper. I need to dig really deep. And that seemed like the logical place to break ground was into Rudy's banjo style. Uh, because I just loved the sound of it. So I started searching for information about Rudy Lyle, and I found very little. Um, Doug Hutchins interviewed Rudy just months before he passed, uh, back in 84. Okay. And that was published in Bluegrass Unlimited. But beyond that, there was really not a whole lot of information about his life. Right. And there wasn't a whole lot of information about his play or his style, which seemed distinct to me. It didn't quite seem like how Earl Scruggs played or how Ralph Stanley or Don mm -hmm. Reno played. So it it came out of uh, you know not not having his tab. I thought, all right, well, I'll start with White House Blues, and I had so much fun doing it. You know, one one led to the other, and um, before I knew it, I had uh, started this project. Ultimately, ended up transcribing everything that he recorded, all of his breaks that he recorded with Bill Monroe. How many how many tracks were actually recorded that? Well, he actually recorded more tracks with Bill Monroe than any other banjo player in all of history, except for Blake Williams, who was the last banjo player to play in the Bluegrass Boys. Okay. So he recorded just a, a huge amount with Monroe. Um, however, he didn't take breaks on all of those. So the ones he took breaks on is maybe... 18 or 19. I can't recall off the top of my head, but it's it's less than 20. Wow. Um, how would you describe his his style that, you know, how it, you know, differentiated from from Earl Scruggs, who was before him as well in the, in, mm. you know, in the Bluegrass Boys? It's different on a lot of levels. Um, I think the most immediate was that Rudy was a very spontaneous player. He was a very spontaneous musician. 
he actually, before I talk about his spontaneity, I, I just want to mention that Rudy comes from Southwest Virginia, uh, from mm -hmm. Franklin County, Rocky Mount area. And this was a, an incredible, Rocky Mount was an incredible hotspot for, hotbed rather, for, um, for like pre-bluegrass old time music in mm -hmm. the first half of the century. It was just, it, there was so much going on. And there are all these field recordings that are out there. And when you listen to them, it's just incredible. Um, they were basically old time bands that had three finger banjo playing. And Rudy came up out of that, that environment. He learned a lot from Rocky Mount banjo players like Paul Jefferson and Lawrence Wright. These are the guys that influenced his style. Oftentimes it's easy to look at Rudy like, oh, well, he, he did he did the Scruggs style pretty well, but he actually independently to an extent, I mean, everyone was hearing Earl when Earl was on the Opry, but Rudy mm -hmm. had kind of a distinct style. Wasn't so much uh, copying Earl, but he was, he had the sort of Southwest Virginia style, um, which has all sorts of you know, distinctive qualities to it. But Rudy was a spontaneous musician and he, he would oftentimes improvise when he was recording. There's this great box set that came out uh, four or five years ago uh, called the Complete Castle Sessions or, or something like that. It was uh, everything Bill Monroe recorded from 49 to 51 with every outtake, pretty, uh, pretty exhaustive. And Rudy's on, uh, I think, all of it. And it's really cool to hear the alternate takes of these classic bluegrass songs mm -hmm. because what we hear is that Rudy was changing the way he played the breaks every single time. And that kind of, um, that's not really how, how we tend to play as, as I'm making a huge generalization here, but traditionally bluegrass banjo players are going to work up their break. Um, in the words of Jimmy Martin, study it out, you know, figure out your roles, figure out where the melody is, and then play it note for note perfectly which I think is by and large what Earl Scruggs would do in the recording studio. He knew exactly what he was going to play for his break, and it was just perfect. Mm -hmm. But Rudy was coming from this other place. He was coming from, uh, you know, the seat of the pants, playing what he felt in the moment. And I, I came to realize through interviewing some of the folks for this book that that's a pretty important aspect of his style because it's it's kind of raw and it's it's got an electric energy to it and it's something that i think matched bill monroe's music better at that point in that high lonesome era than than any other banjo player it was very emotional playing uh, so yeah that i mean there's there's so many other qualities of his playing but that's what comes to mind first are there any are there signature licks too as well that 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 he he kind of would would fall back to or was he such such kind of uh, you know somebody who's who's kind of you know you know he's improvising in the studio um, that he kind of changed things up quite a bit. Yeah, uh, there were a few licks that he would go back to, but trying to understand his style is sort of difficult because of what you said, you know, he, he was changing it up so much and so consistently that it's hard to say that's a Rudy Lyle lick. Right. Um, right. But there were some stylistic things he would do. Something that's um, typical of some of the Southwest Virginia playing is, is this sort of um, walk up or walk down. <laughs> string. Um, there's a classic bluegrass banjo lick that is sometimes referred to as the roll in my sweet baby's arms lick. Something like that. That's how Earl Scruggs would play it. Uh -huh. um, Rudy would change that up a little bit. He would use just a forward roll like that. To most people it probably sounds identical. 
but <laughs> for us banjo players who are concerned with the details, is a little different from from that. So that was one sort of common lick that Rudy played in his own way. Um, and Bill Emerson told me, I, I had the great honor to interview Bill Emerson just months before he passed. Um, that interview is included in the book. Bill told me that Rudy would, um, you know, banjo players will oftentimes choke the second string. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Bill told me that Rudy would sometimes do it, the same lick, but on the third string. Higher up the neck. Which... Right. It's kind of kind of interesting. Um, it does sound a little different, and there that actually that information helped me out a lot when I was transcribing all of the breaks because there were a couple licks that I thought I, I just couldn't figure them out. And when Bill told me that, was, ah, that's how he did it. He was over here, so he was already set up for notes up the neck. All right. It's always great when you get little little keys to unlock you know, when you're trying to transcribe something like that. Yeah, totally. And how did Bill know, how, how did, how did Bill know, know him, did he, his playing like that? It was through Jimmy Martin. Uh, okay. Bill Emerson played in Jimmy Martin's band in the sixties, I think. Um, and uh, of course, Jimmy Martin and Rudy Lyle were good right. friends. They played at Bill Monroe together. And so when Bill was in Jimmy Martin's band, Bill Emerson, uh, they were in Nashville, and Jimmy Martin says, how would you boys like to go meet Rudy Lyle? And so they went up to the, the hotel, the Tulane Hotel, or wherever Rudy was staying at the time. And uh, Jimmy Martin's whole band was there, and they just sat around and hung out with Rudy Lyle in the hotel room. So Bill got to sit down two banjos with Rudy and... Uh, swap some licks and just watch watch Rudy play and you know he noticed that Rudy had his own his own way of playing things like that right. third string choke um are, who are some of other are there other kind of famous banjo players of the of the southern virginia style that you've kind of mentioned that we would know about oh there are but i can't think of them off the top of my head um, well, Butch Robbins. Butch Robbins okay. is a great banjo player. Of course, he had a, a oh, I should say he has a, um, well, he's really interesting because he's got one foot in deep tradition and the other foot in a sort of iconoclastic, um, almost, well, progressive banjo playing, I guess you could call yeah. it. Uh, but he's from down there. I mean, there's so many great banjo players from that part of the country. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Doug Hutchins is, is from Southwest Virginia, and he's a great, it's just a well of information about the bluegrass tradition. Um, and he, I think he plays a little bit of everything, but he played bass with Bill Monroe for a time. And who are some of the other um, banjo players you interviewed in the book? You... The interviews were my favorite part of the whole project, getting to track these people down. Yeah. Um, doing some detective work to try to get in touch with them. And it was just such, it was like the honor of, of a lifetime to get to talk to some of these guys. Uh, so I spoke, like I mentioned, I spoke with Bill Emerson just months before he passed. I also had the great, great honor of speaking to Sonny Osborne again, months before he passed. Um, I spoke also with Alan Mundy, Butch Robbins, Doug Hutchins, um, Joe Drumright Jr who's sometimes known as Jody Drumright, uh, whose father, Joe Drumright, was a good friend of Rudy's. Um, who else did I speak with? I, that might cover, well, here, I don't want to leave anybody out, so let me just make sure I've got all the interviews here. Sure. Um, oh, Bobby Lyle. Yeah, uh, Rudy's brother, who's a great accordion player um, down in Maryland. And uh, it was great to talk with Rudy's brother, Bobby, because he, I mean, he just, he knew Rudy so well, and he just told me so much about their family. It's a very musical family. Um, talked to me about young Rudy and some of the wild adventures they would go on up in the hills. So, yeah, it was, it was so much fun to hear the stories. 
And how did you track it? To, were these all over the phone interviews, or did you go and visit these people in person? They were all over the phone. I wish I could have gotten to sit down with, with all of these people. That would have been so great. But this was my COVID project. I started okay. this at, pretty much at the beginning of the pandemic. And so right. travel and sitting down with uh, especially some of these older folks. Yeah, yeah. isn't going to happen. Yeah. How long did the project take from beginning to end? It took two years. Wow. It took two years. And it was great to, to wear so many different hats. You know, it started with the transcriptions. Um, which I would, I, at the time I was working for an online poker website and I was on the, <laughs> I was on the graveyard shift. So I'd work from 8, 8 PM to 4 AM and it was oftentimes really slow. So I just had to be at, in front of the computer in case I was needed. And, uh, so I would just sit there at these, you know, during the witching hours of the night. Right listening to Rudy slowed down to 0.25% or, or 25% rather. Right. And just picking out very quietly so as to not wake up my neighbors, each and every little note, trying to get each and every note just right. And that was, you know, <laughs> a lot of fun at times kind of weird when it's three in the morning and you're really thinking hard about which string he's bending. <laughs> um, after that, I started doing the interviews, which, you know, like I mentioned, was just a lot of fun, just tracking these guys down. I tracked them down in a number of different ways. I mean, I used Facebook sometimes. Um, Tony Trishka, uh, who wrote the foreword to the book, uh, was a huge help to me throughout the whole process. He's, he's sort of mentored me and give, gave me support when I needed it and mm -hmm. really believed in the project. And, and without him, I certainly wouldn't have finished it or even started it i think but he helped me get in touch with sunny um and you know one thing sort of leads to another um when one banjo player will put you in touch with another it's such a great community yes yeah, it's, it's yeah. a lot of open doors you know which is right. really special well do you want to play another tune for us sure yeah i'll play another of rudy's this won't be his tune, but I'll play his break to one of my favorites. Uh, this is called Sugar Coated Love. And this was a, a really great duet sung by Bill Monroe and Carter Stanley of the Stanley Brothers, who was for a time a member of Bill Monroe's band. And the stuff they recorded together is, it's just, I think it's just fantastic. Their singing is so great together. And Rudy Lyle's break on this is so cool to me because of how spacious it is. He leaves a lot of space. He doesn't roll through the whole thing, which is kind uh -huh. of the default, you know, just to, to keep that forward roll going or something. Rudy leaves a lot of space in this break. about this before I play it, something that I was kind of surprised to find, is that Rudy Lyle never, <clears throat> he always played out of the G shape. And what I mean by that is, if he were playing a song in the key of C, like Sugar Coated Love, instead of playing his C chord and his F chord and his G chord, he would just capo up five and then play as though he were in the key of G. Um, there's one recorded instance of him playing in the key of D, and instead of playing his D chord and his G chord down here, or instead of capoing at two or doing something mm -hmm. that is more common, he actually capoed all the way up at the seventh fret <laughs> and got his fifth string all the way up to a high D wow. and just played it up there. And it sounds so cool. Yeah. That's Get Up John, by the way, the Bill Monroe tune, Get Up John, that he does that on. Um, it's a distinctive sound, at least. Anyway, yeah, yeah, so yeah. sugar coated love. Sure. 
short little break. Um, but it's it's just so cool how he just he takes this as a motif, repeats it, and then instead of playing it a third time, he goes brings it up the octave before finally on the fourth time bringing it home. Right. And then he ends it with this crazy lick. Which for 1951, I think it was recorded, was pretty, pretty fresh sounding. Right, yeah. It's like an electric guitar lick, um, <laughs> which makes a certain amount of sense because he did play electric guitar too. Okay. Did he have a little single string flourishes in there as well? Did it... Believe it or not, there's no single string in that lick. Okay. Um, was, is that where you're hearing it or in other parts? Of or the just brain? in general, just in, or in any, any of his, because any of his licks, any of his breaks? I don't think so. Okay. Well, he would, you know, his, his break on Rawhide, it's not quite single string because it's um, the B part's quarter notes. It's, it's, so that's not really single string, I guess. I know. But he and Don Reno and Earl Scruggs, they were all good friends, and they were all listening a lot to each other. So I'm sure he was aware of the style. Uh, but I don't, I don't, not to my knowledge, I don't think he played a lot of single string licks. Right. Well, some, some, how it's nice and concise is it makes it, you know, a number of these breaks are in the book are, are nice and short. So it makes it really easy and digestible to, to go and just learn this, this break. Um, and it's really tabbed out really, really clearly, you know, I've got the book here, everybody just so you can show it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a great book on, on how it, you know, it, you know, ex explain, goes through, you know, it's like, kind of reminds me of the Earl Scruggs book in a lot of ways in that there's parts that you just read and then there, there's the tab parts and stuff but it's kind of even a little bit better with how it explains each tune and and how it gives you the recording and, and the date that was recorded and um so it's really nice to just to go through and and, and read and then also just try out some of these breaks what kind of uh and and, and and what tab software did you use to do it? Because it was really legible tab. Oh, good, good. I used uh, MuseScore, which is a great free yeah. music notation program. Right. Um, yeah, and actually the, the second edition, which is out now, has even bolder printed tab. Um, when I, I sent a, a few copies to Tony Trishka as soon as I got them from the printers, because like I mentioned, he's, he was such a, a guide to me throughout the process. And uh, Tony called me as soon as he got them. He said, the book is great. It, it's really, you've done a good job. The one thing I have to say is you should make the, um, the tab a little bit bolder. And I thought, well, maybe. And then he said, I showed it to Bela Fleck too. And Bela agrees. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, okay, okay, all right, I'll make it bolder. <laughs> right. It, it helps people like myself who have, you know, terrible eyesight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, friends just being, ah, I can't see it. Yeah, exactly. So why do you think, you know, why do you think kind of Rudy's playing has been overlooked for, you know, for so long? And, and what kind of happened? Mm. Well, first of all, he, he was the first banjo player to record with Bill Monroe after Earl Scruggs. Um, Don Reno did play with Bill Monroe in that interim period, but they, uh, they never went into the studio and recorded. Um, and... Earl Scruggs is just such a giant in the banjo world, and rightly so. I mean, those, that's a tough act to follow. Yeah. yeah. Um, really tough, you know. And, and when, when Earl left Bill Monroe's band, he started the Foggy Mountain Boys with Lester, and they just took over. I mean, they were just a force right. in, in bluegrass music. They were the most popular for a long time. Um, and so... That's the, the quick answer, but, uh, but there's more to it, I think. Uh, in 1952, I believe, Rudy was drafted to, to fight in the army, to fight in the Korean War. And um, this was while he was playing in Bill's band. So he left Bill Monroe's band, he left Nashville, and went off to Korea. 
And unfortunately, he saw really, really brutal combat over there. It's really incredible that that he survived at all mm. which robin's th this is somewhat hearsay so don't take these numbers literally but butch robin's told me that someone told him that out of his his group of a hundred men fighting uh there were about three that survived and rudy was Gee. one of them wow so it was just just awful awful combat he saw um and, and they were fighting a lot with mortars lots of loud, loud. explosions yeah. And so he got some pretty bad hearing damage. You know, when he when he came back a couple of years later, um, he had severe PTSD from from the combat mm -hmm. he saw and that he was involved in. And his hearing was, was seriously damaged. Um, he his banjo didn't sound right to him, so he opened it up. We're, as banjo players, we, we tend to mess around with our instruments a fair amount because they're so mechanical. Um, but he went extreme. He opened up his banjo and he took a, a knife and carved out the inner ply of the rim to try to make it sound louder. And um, some people say that he was drilling holes in his tone ring too. And basically, he ruined the banjo trying to get it to sound better, which is a shame because it was a... a an original 1929 wreath pattern RB3 flathead that if you had it today in its original state it would be you know it, it would be that or a house really right. because its value right um, in any case he switched to electric guitar because it was louder right and and he, he quit Bill Monroe's band I do have to mention though that he, he did record with Bill after fighting in the war and after messing with this banjo, and it's some of his best work, White House Blues and John Henry, his playing on there is just, it's unparalleled. It's just beautiful stuff. But anyway, he quit, he quit playing banjo for the most part. Um, he went on to, to become a, a session player, electric guitar. Okay. He played with the young Patsy Cline. He played with uh, all these great country acts. Um, and he actually had a band with Benny Martin, too, on the electric fiddle or was it the eight string fiddle i can't remember which fiddle he was playing but he had a, a sort of a country band with benny martin for a time um, they played at bean blossom and there's some recordings of them out there and it's so cool to hear rudy play the electric guitar um, and to notice some of his sensibilities that you would hear on his banjo come through in his mm -hmm. guitar playing um, he played like uh like a hank garland style of electric guitar so kind of Kind of like, you know, 50s Nashville country guitar style, little jazz influence. Right. But I think his his retiring from banjo playing, for the most part, is is a huge contributing factor regarding why why he yeah was he was he though. wasn't in the bluegrass scene he wasn't hanging out and yeah, yeah he wasn't like a, a part of the revival in, in the 60s and 70s he just, right. You know, when, when Doug Hutchins told me when he went to go do the article, the interview with Rudy for Bluegrass Unlimited back in the 80s, Rudy was kind of flabbergasted. And he kept saying to Doug, well, no one remembers who I am. Why, why do you want to do this? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I think that's you know, a couple of reasons we don't. He's, he's not quite as well known. As, as I think he should be. Right. Well, you did some detective work to track down his banjo, didn't you? I did. I did. Maybe that was the most fun part of the project. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the whole project you enjoyed. It was fun. It was a good project. Um, yes. So I, Doug Hutchins told me when I was interviewing Doug about Rudy, um, he, well, first of all, everyone I spoke with, everyone I interviewed, at some point in the interview would say, oh, you know, I wonder what became of that banjo that he destroyed. Wonder where it is now. Sonny Osborne told me he saw it for sale in Nashville back in the 60s and took it home and played it for a few nights and uh, didn't like the sound of it. He looked in there and saw the rim had been messed with. and He didn't want it. 
Right. I think it was for sale for like five grand or something at that time. Um, but um, when I spoke with Doug, Doug said, "Oh, you know, I wish I knew where that banjo was." And, and I said, "Yeah, do you have any any sense?" And, and Doug said, after his interview with Rudy Lyle was published in Bluegrass Unlimited back in '84, there was a series of letters to the editor with people saying, "I have it," or no, you don't. Or I heard I heard the banjos here or there, somewhere. So I went on eBay, and I ordered all the issues of Bluegrass Unlimited from 1984 and 85 too, just to be safe. Which is kind of wild that um, that those were available. I'm really really grateful that they were. So I sat down with this huge stack of 24 magazines, and um, they they came from a collector. So each one was in a sort of cellophane envelope. And so one by one, I would unseal the envelope, pull it out, and, uh, you know, it's actually really fun to go through these old issues and just see who was on the scene then and, and right, what, yeah. what the vibes were back then. But uh, Sure enough, I, I went through each of the letters to the editor, and um, I think in November of that year, I, I, f I found someone who said, I have it. And then the next issue, all these other people wrote in and said, oh, well, you might have it, but it might just be the neck based on your description. And um, it, was, it was kind of fun just to, to follow this thread. Bill Emerson ended up writing in and saying, I did play that banjo for a time um, after Rudy got rid of it, traded it to, um, to the great luthier Tom Morgan. Mm -hmm. Tom lent it to Bill Emerson for his first gig with Jimmy Martin. So Bill weighed in. Anyway, this this one guy in, in Rochester, New York, which is where my father's from, uh, it seemed like he probably had the neck of the banjo. Um, and so I, I tried to get in touch with him. I, I typed his name in with banjo to Google, found nothing. Typed his name in with bluegrass, found a guy in North Carolina, but the name was off by one letter. So... Um, I, I, it took me a long time, and I finally found um, at the University of Rochester, there was a professor there whose name matched the name I was looking for, and uh, it's a professor of astronomy, and I thought that's a good sign because I know a handful of astronomers who really love bluegrass, so I thought this could be my guy, so I wrote to him, and um, I didn't hear back for several days, and I, I just decided, you know, I basically given up at that point I thought mm -hmm. well it's a mystery but then after uh, after several more days I got an email back from him saying yeah it's me I'm the one who wrote that letter and I still have the banjo and I said oh this is great news so I said you know could I come visit you and, and look at the banjo and photograph it for this book that I'm working on with Rudy Lyle and he said of course and so uh, I made the drive out to, to Rochester, and, um, and we've struck up a good friendship and, uh, you know, had a really good time. I've gone out to see him a couple times since. Um, I have an aunt and uncle and a handful of cousins that all live out there, so I'm out there from time to time. But anyway, to, to see this, the banjo neck that Rudy Lyle had uh, recorded all of these breaks on, all of these breaks that I learned that nooks and crannies on, and to play it, it was a profound experience. It was so cool. Um, and it was just the neck. It was on a different pot. The, right. The, the pot is out somewhere in the abyss. It's probably been thrown yeah. out or something. You, 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 dove, you, you dove so deep into, into his plane. So, the, so uh, um, you know, feeling that neck, I can understand. It would be, it'd really be, you know, surreal and that how it just... You can really put yourself in, in that place in that time. Yeah. Yeah, it was really cool. It was really cool just to imagine like, oh, that's where his thumb was too when he played these licks. Was there anything uh, unique like in like the wear of the, of the of the neck or the fret wear or anything like that just could, that's you remember and you could kind of imagine, you know? Yeah, it was it, the finish was quite worn. Uh, especially down here, uh -huh. um, 
I mean, Rudy stopped playing that banjo in the mid 1950s, and uh, it was traded a number of times um, before uh, before this gentleman got it. So you know, it's like I worked at an instrument shop for a long time and would just kind of look up at these hundred-year-old banjos on the walls and, and just wonder. And a customer came in once and was doing the same thing. We were kind of just <laughs> musing on the, the stories of these instruments. And he said, you know, it's sometimes you can think about it like, oh, I own this instrument. But actually, the instrument owns you because this banjo is going to outlive me. Someone else will play this banjo one day. And this banjo was made in the late 20s. And surely a lot of people have owned it before me. And so to hold Rudy's was cool because it was like, yeah, this was Rudy's. And it's also belonged to so many other people and it will, it will continue the story. Um, so it was cool. But yeah, the finish was quite worn down. Could I say that was Rudy's doing in part? Certainly. But, you know, banjo had been played 60 years more after Rudy let it go. So who knows? <laughs> well, you've really kind of, dove into kind of you know the older styles of bluegrass versus styles of bluegrass how do you kind of compare what the the two styles the old and the new yeah and, and what do you what kind of you know it's almost more what kind of emotion you know do you get from some of those some of those older styles versus mm. the kind of the flashier um you know modern modern styles Hmm. It's interesting. There's a lot of different angles to, to get at that, um, from which to get at that. Um, you know, for its time, bluegrass in the early 50s was really um, flashy, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it was that. Yeah. Um, a lot of Rudy's playing, and a lot, certainly a lot of Earl's playing, was like really very modern for its time. Right. They were coming up with a lot of their own ideas and a lot, they were being influenced by a lot of contemporary musicians, you know, I'm thinking of like Sonny Osborne playing pedal steel licks on the banjo. Mm -hmm. Earl would sometimes like, how about this one? Like, like that, that kind of lick, that's so cool. And that's rock and roll, you know, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I guess I'm saying that all just to make the point that even in that, that early era of bluegrass music, um, it was, it was very modern. It was very, yeah. very modern. They were, they had big ears. They were listening to all these other genres of music too. Um, is there a groove from, thing that's different? Do you feel, or is there, groove? You know, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. The older bluegrass music was still connected to, to old time music and to dance. Mm -hmm. People were still playing a lot for dances. Um, and there's something to that that's really difficult to express in words. But when you're playing for people who are dancing, there's, it's like the music comes full circle. Mm -hmm. The rhythms come full circle. You know, when music becomes embodied, it starts to make a whole lot more sense. So I do think that um, that those early guys were way more connected. This is a big generalization, but by and large, more connected to um, to the dance of the music and also mm -hmm. just to to the culture of the music. Um, I live in Boston, and the big music school here is Berkeley School of Music, <coughs> which is a great place. And, and um, just so many amazing musicians have gone through the program and, and teach there. Um, but when you when you take music and put it in an academic institution, inevitably, you're going to lose aspects of it. And um, I had the great fortune of spending a fair amount of time down in Southwest Virginia and um, it was pretty eye-opening for me to go to some jam sessions down there because it was, it was like the community was there. 
like it's what people were doing on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. Musicians and non-musicians alike. It was the community. And that kind of blew my mind coming from New England. And a lot of my experience had been like the jamming was your audience was mostly other musicians. And um, it wasn't so much about this is a community of people who have an art form that sounds like this. So when I, when I spent some time down in Virginia, it really opened my eyes. It was like, oh, this is not only a music that has roots in dancing, but this is a music that's a culture. And when we take the music out of that culture and put it in an academic institution, I think it's really important just to acknowledge that we're losing part of the soul of the music. We're losing part of the life of the music when it becomes something that is graded, you know? Right. And I, you know, ETSU down in Eastern Tennessee is a great bluegrass program. I'm all for bluegrass programs in schools. I think it's a great thing, but I think it's important just to acknowledge that uh, this is a music that's cultural. It's not just a genre. And I think those older guys, they were there, they were coming from these communities and they knew that. So right. You, you can never replace, you know, uh, you know, music that's, you know, musicians that are truly playing from their culture. You see it here in New Orleans a lot. And, uh, and, and there, there's, some, there's a certain thing that's, that's, um, you know, you can never, you can never, um, you know, sort of learn. It is just something versus if you grew up with it and it's just part of your life. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like a, a more holistic understanding of, of music. Yeah. Um, so do you have any other, we have a question here and it's one of my questions as I had as well, Julie Colton, the regular viewer here, she's asking, are there any other projects in the pipeline? Are you concentrating on playing in the band now? Mm, thank you for the question, Julie. Um, I have, um, a bunch of original banjo tunes I've written. I'm still kind of polishing them up, uh, but I'd like to do an album, uh, an album of banjo music. Um, it's still in the, the brainstorming period, but I've got, I've got a band in mind that I'd okay. like to have back me up. And so yeah, I'd like to do like, uh, you know, there'll be some singing on it, but it'll be a lot of instrumental banjo music. So I'm, I'm scheming that I'm going to be working on that this winter and, trying to figure out a way to make that happen. But um, other than that, I'm, uh, I'm just getting ready for the, the next touring season next year. Yeah. You know, with Peter, we, we play mostly festivals. So it's like a spring through fall. So we're off for the winter by and large. And that album that you're, you're thinking about doing, would it be all um, originals or would it be um, older tunes or, or what? It would be uh, a mix. I've got a handful of originals. I'd probably pick my favorites from that batch of original tunes. Um, but I've got a few older ones that I'd like to do too. Uh, a Wanda Jackson song, Patsy Cline song. Um, some of these old country songs just, they like the banjo. Or the banjo <laughs> likes them. <laughs> so, some of that. Well, this has been great. And, uh, you know, I really enjoyed going through the book and um, I'm looking forward to going through it some more. Uh, we have it on our, on our website on deerandbanjos.com. Um, you can find it also as well. Can you find it on your website, Max? Yes, you can. Okay. And is there any other places people can get it? Can they get it at any, you know, any bookstore yeah. or anything like that? Yeah, yeah, it's also for sale uh, down at County Sales in Floyd, Virginia, and um, Elderly Instruments is carrying it as well. Cool, very cool. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely everybody, I, I recommend the book, so uh, check it out. Um, thanks for being here, and would you like to play play us a, a tune as we go out? Sure, I would love to. Uh, before I do, I want to say thanks for having me. It's an honor to be part of the series. And um, I've, my very first banjo was a Deering. In fact, my second banjo was a Deering, too. So I've got a real good. fond spot in my heart for, for Deering banjos. So thank you for having me. Um, and uh, I'd like to close it out with playing uh, what's maybe one of Rudy's best-known breaks. Uh, 
It's the break he took on the Bill Monroe tune, Rawhide. All right. I'm not going to play it as fast as he did, <laughs> because it's, it's very, very fast. But This way we get to hear the notes a little better, too. So here it is, Rawhide. Cool. 